So great pleasure to welcome the great Dr. Bates. Uh, for many of you who don't know him, Dr. Bates, uh, you know, and he's going to say, don't uh, patronize me. Um, Dr. Bates is a retired interventional cardiologist. He's been at the University of Michigan longer than about half this room's been on this planet. 50, uh, 50 years. And, uh, and he's been a key leader in almost all the ACC AHA guidelines, but most importantly on the revascularization and the STEMI guidelines. So he's gonna be giving us sort of an overview of what is the literature supporting the concept of complete revascularization in STEMI, non-STEMI and stable disease. Professor. Thank you. Um, it's nice to be with my people again, because now I do general cardiology, being out of the lab for four years after 40 years in the lab. So thank you for remembering me. Um, I'm not gonna answer any of these questions. The, con the, the con comments were quite thoughtful. And um, I've been working on this for 40 years. I was on the guideline committee report that came out a year ago. And you, remember, you may remember the two surgical societies withdrew support from the document uh, because of the way some of the revascularization guidelines were written. And I had to debate Joe Sabic, who led the revolt and who was on the committee and sat next to me during the deliberations um, at the ACC meeting. And I dug back into the literature, which is a hard thing to do. If you go back and read the papers, you get a different uh, read of the landscape than if you just go with conventional wisdom and expert opinion as things get pushed down the road from generation to generation. <clears throat> so I mean this to be a very disruptive uh, speech. I'm gonna challenge some of your fundamental um, understandings of what you think we're doing and what I think we've been doing. Um, and after 40 years, this is a little bit frustrating for me, I have to admit, because we've always thought we were doing the right thing. So it should be a good discussion period, and there are no right answers. Um, other than on the, on the reports, you got to measure a CK count for STEMI, and you certainly have to measure it after primary PCI. You can't just go with one proponent of six. And in the last case, it's a lot easier to decide if everything's 90%, it's a lot harder to decide if everything's 70%. So there are all kinds of variables you can't put into a one sentence guideline statement or one person's opinion. So uh, the discussion is important. That's the way to go. So let's start with STEMI because I have three different topics. Uh, this has been under the microscope for 10 years. In the 2011 guidelines, it was uh, not recommended that you jump in there and do non-culprit vessel PCI. We were doing only culprit vessel primary PCI. And then <clears throat> perhaps this... Um, strategy of waiting for recurrent symptoms on the left. So do I have a pointer here? No, I got two screens. And up in the left upper corner, waiting for spontaneous recurrent symptoms or a positive stress test to go forward with doing the non-culprit vessels. Um, and that still works for some people. Uh, there was a recent report just this week in uh, JAMA Internal Medicine about this working fine in older patients. Uh, the second strategy is doing everything at once for primary PCI, uh, which can be daunting. Um, when this was initially tried, we had one patient transferred in who had no reflow in the LAD, and then the operator went ahead and did the CERC in the right, and the patient came in in cardiogenic shock and a ventilator and a balloon pump. Another patient we re uh, received with three-vessel PCA came in with acute renal failure on dialysis, so we'll talk about the limitations of doing multivessel primary PCI, though it's an option. And then the third option is the staged PCI, where you do the culprit PCI in the middle of the day or at night, stop, and come back and do it again before hospital discharge or within six weeks. Um, so let's say you have the two pictures up on top. How many of you would do culprit vessel only primary PCI and wait for spontaneous ischemia or a positive stress test to raise your hand? Okay. How many would do both lesions at the same time? Couple. Okay. How many would stage it? Okay. The staging has been more popular, at least in the U.S. It's a little different in other countries where they have uh, restricted access to the cath lab, and they sometimes want to move more quickly, but 
These are all reasonable options, I will say. On the bottom, on the left, uh, doing the culprit vessel only PCI is a quick procedure, low contrast, low radiation. You get the patient out of the lab, you get back on your schedule or go home and go to sleep. Um, the risk is something will activate and you'll have to come back for a second procedure that's unscheduled rather than staged. In the middle, um, if you fix them all at once, you're done, which might be a great strategy for a Friday where you don't want to wait till Monday or Tuesday. So it's good for length of stay. The trouble is, as I suggested, you get a longer procedure time, more contrast volume, a risk for periprocedural MI for each lesion you treat. Um, and the risk actually of doing insignificant stenosis, which is why I point out the 90% lesions on that elective case. Uh, serial angiograms suggest that the acute uh, interpretation of present diameter stenosis on a primary PCI case is probably overestimated by 10 to 20% for the non-culprit PCI lesions. You come back, they're usually uh, less stenotic because of the catecholamine uh, surge being knocked down. So you are at risk for doing lesions that don't necessarily meet criteria for revascularization. And then finally, on the right, um, there might be some more safety, but you're doing two procedures. If you're doing it in an acute hospital stay, the hospital administrator isn't going to like the extra, extra costs. If you do it later, you can double bill it, I guess but you have double access, double this, double that. So there's no really perfect strategy, I would suggest. This is too small to read, but uh, you remember after the 2011 guidelines, there were four studies that took on this class three indication. And the reason this is a little bit difficult to read besides the fact that I put four slides on one is that um, the primary trial was angio-guided, as was the culprit trial, one with 50% stenosis, one with 70%. The two trials on the right use FFR-guided strategies. The colors of red and blue were mixed up based on uh, the graphic artist. Main concept is the lower line with less complete revascularization had worse outcomes. So some of these are freedom, for out uh, freedom of adverse events and some are presence of adverse outcomes. But all four trials suggested a more aggressive strategy would decrease the risk um, for these patients who come to a STEMI, but importantly, no difference in mortality. The, the uh, benefit was shown in recurrent MI or urgent revascularization. So we can debate the importance of that. And then the complete trial was published a couple years ago and that did change the guidelines. Uh, this was a large trial of 4,000 patients, uh, multinational, well done by the Hamilton Group, um, and showed benefit for cardiovascular death and MI. So when you read these trials, you have to be very careful looking at definitions. Note that this is cardiovascular death, not total mortality. So there are an increasing number of studies that show PCI may be decreasing uh, spontaneous MI. If you don't count procedural MI, may improve cardiovascular mortality, but curiously enough, non-cardiovascular mortality goes up. So is cardiovascular mortality a good endpoint or is it total mortality? And in this trial, as in all trials, the, the composite endpoint is all due to MI reduction. So if you say you have death MI and target vessel revascularization in a positive trial, but death and MI show no, no difference on the individual endpoints and TVR is carrying the equation um, as it looks even better on this slide, you really have to ask yourself, um, are they gaming the study and gaming the package insert? And is that enough for me to justify going forward and being more aggressive? You can also see on this trial uh, that on the right lower corner, they only had 600 of the 4,000 patients with four-year follow-up and less than half the patients on three-year follow-up. And that's another problem with looking at randomized trials, but it's so expensive to do these things, it's hard to get the perfect trial. And they only give us direction. They don't give us definitive answers. So Tom showed this slide very quickly. Um, I'm going to dig into it a little deeper um, <laughs> to make the point that it's not carte blanche because of this class one guideline to go revascularize everybody um, after they've had a STEMI. And I actually um, heard Dr. Maida give a report on this at the ACC meeting. He also is quite cautious. So um, the recommendation I underline is in selected patients, in stable patients, in the stage PCI of a significant non-infarct artery stenosis. 
So we need to think about that. It's not everybody with a blockage on an angiogram. Um, so we need to be a little selective, though clearly we're fully justified in going Perfect. forward and doing a complete revascularization for STEMI patients. Tom also showed this slide that went back, went by kind of fast. Importantly, we just had that discussion on the role of elective cabbage in these patients with multivessel disease with acute syndromes as well as with chronic syndromes. And again, um, when you write these one sentence things, you have to be a lawyer. You have to look at every word. This again says selected patients, complex multivessel disease, elective cabbage actually has a two-way recommendation. So you might fix the right, and if you had a distal left main bifurcation or a LAD diag bifurcation and a circ OM bifurcation, consider bypass of the left coronary artery after you fix the right coronary artery and other different combinations of anatomy you might think. So cabbage, especially for three vessel disease, not really at all for two vessel disease, um, has been elevated in all of your discussions as a treatment option, though the patient's always going to choose PCI, as was shown in the last case. There is a 2B recommendation for this um, multivessel primary PCI, is what I call it. Um, so it does work. It has been tried. Case selection is most important, as I'll show you on the next slide. And then there is this three harm for cardiogenic shock. Um, and note this is routine PCI. There are definitely some patients with cardiogenic shock, I think, that would benefit from a non-culprit artery um, intervention. Some of these have two, act two active lesions. For instance, if you fix one, fix one artery and there's Timmy 2 flow in the other artery, I think you probably want to open it up. You just don't want to do it on everybody. This is all based on the culprit shock trial, um, where a third of the patients had acute CTO attempts, despite uh, fixing the index lesion, they got 250 cc's of contrast and the support device went in after the procedure, not before. So no trial's perfect. I think this is probably justified now that we have stents, um, but you have to, again, not consider a class three indication, something that you can never do for an individual patient. So fortunately, um, there's still art to medicine and it's a cognitive sport. Now that the technical part has gotten so much easier and predictable. So let me just spend a minute, because some of you might want to do multivessel primary PCI, and that's fine. But first of all, your index lesion result should be done quickly, have a great result, no complications in a stable patient. And then if you, you know, if it's Friday, you want to think about doing another artery, um, I think that's in play. So two things to think about are number one, the infarct artery, and number two, the non-infarct artery. So let's say you had an LAD infarct, proximal LAD infarct, and had a big area of ischemia, big EKG changes, you got that open, you might not want to take the risk of potentially having a complication on a second artery in contrast to a distal LAD and perhaps an OM lesion, and it's Friday and you don't want to bring them back to do an OM lesion. So it depends on if it's the main artery or the branch, it depends on if it's proximal or distal, Depends on how stable you think the patient is. And the same for the artery you're going to take on for the second lesion. Um, to do a proximal LAD circ and right at one uh, sitting, as was mentioned over here, might have some unusual risk you don't want to assume acutely. You can think about it and stage it. On the other hand, again, if it's a PDA or a diag, you might want to just be done with it and get it over with. And the patient risk is probably pretty small. It's very important on simple versus complex. This works best for simple lesions. You don't want to do CTOs acutely, I would suggest, or bifurcation lesions. And importantly, uh, what I've learned um, is after the first lesion, if you want to go forward, you probably ought to drop a catheter in the left ventricle and make sure the EDP is okay. That's the best way to avoid uh, getting into volume problems with your second or third lesion. And similarly, you guys have all led the way in figuring out renal function and the potential of contrast nephropathy, you need to look at the creatinine in your contrast load because you can always stage it. There's nothing wrong with staging it. So it might be reasonable for some patients, but be especially selective if you decide to go forward. The second topic I'm supposed to address is non-STEMI. Um, and in fact, there's no data on complete revascularization in patients who come with non-STEMI. I was a little surprised to learn that when I got assigned this uh, <laughs> talk 
Uh, the Europeans have a 2A indication for complete revascularization and non-stemming based on expert consensus. So in the European guidelines, they allow expert consensus before they make their guideline recommendations. On the US guidelines, we don't allow that. You have to have the evidence. So in fact, we are completely silent on the revascularization guidelines and whether complete revascularization is indicated, and that's because if there's no evidence in the US guidelines, ACCHA guidelines, you can't make a statement. You have no evidence. So there was this trial that some of you may have noted um, presented at the ACC, and I looked at it again because it says ACS, but importantly, it doesn't say non-ST segment elevation ACS. So again, all these trials are tricky. This actually had 40% STEMI, 10% unstable angina, and 50% non-STEMI. And they excluded patients with CTOs, which is about 25% of the patients we might see in the lab. I mean, I don't think they counted periprocedural MI, which would be especially important for an aggressive, uh, one-setting, acute intervention. They did see a difference in this big combined out point, uh, endpoint, but again, it's only 700, well, let's see, they had 1,400 patients. They had no individual endpoint differences and no difference in death or MI. So I think we, re we recurrently see this finding that we decrease uh, spontaneous MI and we decrease emergency trips back to the cath lab with a more aggressive strategy. But I don't know what to tell you about non-STEMI. I think we've conflated non-STEMI with STEMI, and that's probably okay. Because the non-STEMI patients actually may be higher risk. They may have more uh, vulnerable plaques that are untreated, um, but I can't give you any more direction than that. Now, I do want to shake your cages on complete revascularization for uh, stable coronary artery disease, um, particularly surgery particularly considering what our goals of therapy are. Um, it's amazing how many incorrect citations there are in the current literature or even in recent talks. Uh, for instance, we assume the bypass graft surgery in patients with three vessel disease makes people live longer. And to my shock looking at this, there's actually no data supporting that concept. So the first three trials on this chart were pilot trials. It took several years to enroll 100 patients at the dawn of revascularization therapy. The next three trials, the VA Cooperative, the ECSS, and the CAS trials are landmark, wonderful trials uh, when I was a house officer, actually, and a medical student. But there are only 2,400 patients here, and they were negative trials. It's only when you put them together and do subset analyses and a meta analysis that you got. The story about left main disease and three vessel disease and maybe proximal LAD disease. But the data are 40 to 50 years old. And I, I think from a guideline perspective, we shouldn't be citing data from the last century to support treatment in 2023. So I don't think those reports actually should be cited anymore in the literature. It should be honored in book chapters. But they're given as primary support for class one indications for revascularization even now, just carried on from guideline committee to guideline committee. There are some so-called recent studies. Uh, the first two mass trials were done in Brazil. Uh, really the only treatment, treat, the only trial we can depend on is the very 2D trial. And that's now what, 18 years old. And that showed no mortality survival for PCI or for cabbage versus medical therapy in an era which I'll argue we didn't have medical therapy, as I'll explain a little bit later. The STIS trial we'll talk about too, that's completely different. That was ischemic LVEF um, on echo and really doesn't pertain to stable coronary artery disease. So if we talk about surgical therapy for uh, coronary artery disease, we really don't have good evidence to support what we're recommending. In fact, to be completely disruptive, these are from my review, and you can help me fill this list out if I miss something, the most recent uh, trials of revascularization therapy versus medical therapy for chronic coronary disease or stable ischemic heart disease, depending on the term you choose. Uh, Berry 2D had 347 patients with cabbage. Uh, ischemia had 530 patients. Uh, Stitch had 610 patients. Not a big data set for cabbage. Um, we recommend it routinely for diabetes, no difference in mortality at five years. So where's that recommendation coming from? Observational trials. 
common sense maybe, courage, no difference versus medical therapy back a long time ago, and we're much better with it now. Uh, FFR guided PCI, the FAME trials are routinely misquoted. Uh, no difference in death, no difference in MI. You take 90% lesions or ACS lesions, put them on medical therapy, do an FFR, treat some acutely. Of course, the guys you don't treat with class one indications are going to come back in and bias the study results. Uh, CTOs, some of you are doing that. No impact on death or mortality. In fact, the complication rate is a little bit higher. No improvement in injection fraction. It's just to relieve symptoms. And then two trials, one with cabbage and one with PCI and ischemic cardiomyopathies. Again, disappointingly, frustratingly, so no impact on death or MI. So I'm not sure if we all took a test on this before this slide, we would have made those conclusions. And then I was on the guideline committee, but when I went back and had to study these, I'm really embarrassed by the mistakes in the guidelines. For instance, this slide is titled multi-vessel CAD. The recommendation is for three-vessel CAD, not for two-vessel CAD. So I don't like that. <laughs> um, the reason we got in trouble with the surgeons is we dropped it from class one to class two B because there's no data showing survival benefit with cabbage. It probably works, but by guideline definitions, that's a 2B definition. We probably should have made it 2A, and then we wouldn't have had the conflict. One of my rules is not to drop something two stages at one sitting. Um, I think it's correct, but it, politically it was a bad move. And then there's uh, another complaint from the surgeons is we gave the same guideline recommendation for PCI. Um, we tried to finesse that by saying for surgery, it may be reasonable, for PCI, it's uncertain, but again, the limitation of the guidelines is you only get a 2B or a 2A. You don't get to modify it one or two or three different ways. So right now, um, for complete revascularization, at least for survival, uh, you can do it, but we don't have good data, and it's only a 2B indication right now. And then we got in trouble again, I think the surgeons made a good point on this one. Uh, we came to the recommendation that you reduce cardiovascular events equally with PCI as with cabbage. And perhaps we do. There's some newer data suggesting with longer term follow up, PCI may decrease spontaneous MI. It does decrease urgent revasc. Um, but I think if you look at the head to head studies in the left main trials or um, in the same three trial, which I may have here in a second. Uh, surgery probably does do a better outcome result, at least at 10 years, in decreasing mortality risk and preventing MI. So the surgeons are probably fair to suggest that in three-vessel disease, they do have some advantages, although they have higher acute um, complication rates. And this is the FAME-3 trial, which again was disappointing to an interventionalist. This was in just three-vessel disease patients. This was using FFR-guided PCI versus cabbage. 3.4 graphs versus 3.7 graphs. Um, this darn combined endpoint, death, MI, CVA being important endpoints, repeat revasc being a softer endpoint. Uh, PCI was trying to show non-inferiority and did not even show non-inferiority. It flunked. So the results might not be too surprising if you look at the literature on coronary disease. Cabbage does have more acute complications. It's more durable. There is a slight early risk of stroke. PCI uh, probably doesn't do as well in long-term prevention of mortality or prevention of MI um, or repeat revascularization. For an individual patient, these don't mean anything. They may choose the PCI every time. But from a data set on a population level, cabbage has some advantages that we have to uh, accept, and I think we have the last couple of years. So let me just talk a little bit more on left ventricular dysfunction, which has also been severely misrepresented in the literature. We have a class one indication saying that my lines got buggered up here. Um, Multivessel disease, cabbage, EF less than 35, recommended to improve survival. I would say the data on that are quite weak. And 35 to 50% reasonable to improve survival. So pretty strong 
a level of support for going ahead and doing revascularization for patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy. How many of you routinely do an angiogram on somebody with a LBEF that's low to look for coronary disease? Okay. And how many do revascularization thinking we've helped them even if they don't have symptoms? So it's, it's sticky, it's tough. Um, one of the most misquoted studies in the literature is the STITCH trial, which again concluded um, enrollment in 2007, so it's 15 years old. Um, those are the curves for their combined endpoint. Uh, so this is just for death. So the, the title, uh, the, the topic in question. But this is a severely misrepresented trial. Number one, only 50% of the patients had angina. So they were treating an ejection fraction, not a patient that we might see who comes in with chest discomfort. Uh, they only enrolled two and a half patients per site per year. So really selected, not routine care. Um, they stopped, I said, 15 years ago. Most of what we do was not available then, believe it or not, for you younger guys. Uh, only 20% had an ICD, which is a class one recommendation for an LVEF under 35% in ischemic cardiomyopathy. And in fact, it was a negative trial when it was initially published in uh, 2011. And more frustrating, uh, documentation of ischemia or improved ejection fraction after revascularization had no impact on outcome measurements. So viable muscle, ischemia, improvement in ejection fraction, all these concepts are under debate actually after all these years. There was an extension they put in um, midway through enrollment, which is called the STITCHES trial. And that did come out a couple of years ago and that did show a suggestion for a 10 year benefit. So when you quote the STITCH trial showing benefit, you need, really need to quote the STITCHES uh, ran, uh, reference and not the STITCH trial. Robert Guyton has uh, been on the guidelines committees. He's really thoughtful, intense supporter of Cabbage, wrote the editorial and said it really supports a class 2A indication by the way we define recommendations. So I don't know why it has a class one recommendation. And then recently, uh, last year, you saw the revived PCI trial where they tried the same thing. Even fewer people had symptoms, uh, no impact of viability or ischemia or ejection fraction improvement on outcome, no benefit. So I don't know what to do with asymptomatic ischemic cardiomyopathy. I think we have to default to this nice graphic, which basically summarizes everything we've learned over 40 years and keep to forgetting and that is, you really need to put patients on maximal medical therapy, and if they have ischemic cardiomyopathy, that includes CRT or ICD implantation. And then only the patients with angina really should go forward to the cath lab, because we only know what revascularization does in people who are symptomatic. We still have no evidence that revascularizing asymptomatic patients makes any difference. And now, I really think even the ejection fraction is not as strong an indication as I thought it might be. So finally, just rec let me review for you what does change prognosis in patients with stable coronary disease. And that's medical therapy. That's not PCI. And only in 2007, after the STITCH trial completed enrollment, did the ACCHA guidelines actually come out saying lifestyle interventions were a class one indication. And only did they say risk factor modification to targets was a class one indication. So we've only had medical therapy since 2007. And all the surgery trials are before 2007. And now we have PCSK9 inhibitors and we have the SGLT2 inhibitors and um, ARNI and CRT. And these are the things we still need to go hard on. And if you look at recent registry reports on how many of our patients are getting optimal medical therapy, it's incredibly disappointing to see how few of them get the simple stuff. Part of its tolerance, part of its adherence, part of its cost, but we can't just do the PCI, we have to do the whole show. So I'm sorry I can't give you a stronger direction on how to go take care of your patients next week. Um, and I will state that complete revascularization as a term is not mentioned at all in the guidelines. We really talk now about complex disease versus simple disease. 
So it's interesting that you assigned me this topic and we probably ought to dig into it again and say, how come we aren't talking about complete revascularization again? We're talking about complex versus simple. I will say again, that PCI does not change mortality. We're really looking at symptom relief. Um, FFR does not impact death or MI rates. If you wanna do it to select uh, patients for stenting, I think that's fine, but recognize its limitations. We really don't know the timing on how to sequence these as we've argued about earlier this morning, but I want to especially emphasize that if you do more than the index lesion acutely, please be careful because that's where you get complications. Make sure they're stable hemodynamically, make sure it's a small area of risk, either on the first artery or the second artery, make sure their kidneys are okay. Then importantly, if you are gonna do a so-called quote, complete revascularization, make sure that each lesion still meets elective PCI standards, tight, positive FFR, 90% uh, lesions, I think, are fair game for anybody because natural history is to include 50 to 70% lesions, you especially need to do FFR. And don't forget about cabbage. So that's the best I can do, Professor. Thanks Thank for inviting me back to your group.